For I go about doing nothing else than urging you, young and old, not to care for your persons or your property more than for the perfection of your souls. And even so much, I tell you that virtue does not come from money, but from money comes virtue and all other good things to man, both to the individual and to the state. Uh, with these words, Socrates gives some estimate of the importance of virtue in classical Greek philosophy. Indeed, it's not too much to say that virtue is the single most important thing to the, in, in uh, classical Greek ethics. And that's fortunate, since this is the subject of our course. So, in this uh, uh, prologue lecture, I'm going to outline the themes of the course. Um, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the concept of virtue in Greek thought and the importance of the virtues in a later uh, Western uh, thought and culture uh, a little bit, uh, as well as some of the issues which have led to the decline of the concept of virtue. Alastair MacIntyre, the Scottish philosopher, famously wrote a book after virtue, lamenting the decline of virtue ethics in uh, modern Western thought. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the factors in that. Uh, I will talk about why virtue was so important to classical Greek thinkers, uh, the connection that they saw between virtue and happiness, that is virtue and the good life, the connection between virtue and friendship, uh, and virtue and politics, and uh, arguably all of these things are just as true today as in the time of uh, classical Greece. Uh, I don't think that you'll find an awful lot of the themes of classical Greek philosophy have been uh, dated. We'll talk also about some of the debates on virtue in Greek philosophy. The debate about um, which will take place in the very first dialogue we'll, we'll discuss of Plato, the Protagoras, the teachability of virtue, if, so, if one could put it that way. Can virtue be taught? Can one acquire virtue by way of instruction? Uh, and related to that will be the connection between virtue and wisdom. Uh, is virtue, uh, can one acquire the virtues through wisdom? and will distinguish the intellectualism of Plato uh, and Aristotle's emphasis on habits. And in addition to this uh, connection between virtue and the intellect or wisdom, uh, we'll talk a little bit also about virtue and the passions. And that was another topic of debate. To what degree can virtue and passion uh, coexist? And um, we'll have to say something about the particular virtues. Um, and especially what are called, what have been called uh, <clears throat> in medieval tradition, the cardinal virtues, which were uh, virtues discussed in classical Greek thought, courage, prudence, justice, temperance, but became very much incorporated as well into Christian reflection. Uh, so with that, why don't we uh, begin with a historical overview. The Greek term for virtue is the concept of adete. It's called adete in Greek. And originally this had no uh, necessarily moral meaning. In fact, we could translate it as excellence. So, for example, in Homer, I believe there is a reference to the adete of a horse, meaning its excellence or fitness for that which a horse is supposed to do. And by extension, of course, um, what is the adate or excellence that befits a human being? This is the notion of adate in uh, early Greek thought. And uh, the classicist Werner uh, Jaeger remarks on the fact that this notion of adate was very central to the Homeric uh, tradition, and it began as an aristocratic notion. I believe etymologically, aristos, uh, is related to the concept of adate. So the aristocracy would be those who possess adate in this uh, in archaic Greece. Um, and uh, as Homer remarks, in Homer the real mark of the nobleman is his sense of duty. 
he is judged and is proud to be judged by a severe standards, and the nobleman educates others by presenting to them an eternal ideal to which they have a duty to conform. And Jaeger uses the example of an episode in Homer's Iliad when Glaucus meets uh, Diomede on the battlefield. Um, this is what uh, Bernie Jaeger says, when Glaucus meets Diomede on the battlefield and wishes to prove himself a worthy opponent, he first in the Homeric manner names his illustrious ancestors and then continues, Hippolochus begat me and I claim to be his son. He sent me to Troy and often gave me this command, to strive always for the highest adate and to excel all others. So the Greek Homeric ideal was one of competition for adate, for aristocratic excellence, and that meant things like uh, courage in battle, uh, hospitality, conformity to the etiquette of the time. Uh, now, with the development of uh, Greek uh, philosophy, uh, Arete acquires an ever more uh, moral uh, significance, right? So Plato and Aristotle uh, will be um, often focused in their thought on the notion of Arete in the sense that we uh, think of uh, virtue. So, uh, why now this, the, the Greek understanding of the virtues uh, and the virtuous life as being the most important thing, uh, this uh, passed on to the Roman world through figures like Cicero and became part of the humanistic culture of ancient Rome. Uh, and it also became, uh, it also uh, uh, was central in, for example, Christian scholasticism and even before Christian scholasticism um, in the Christian schema. So the four cardinal virtues from uh, the classical understanding, courage, prudence, justice, and temperance were thought of as natural virtues to which Christian thinkers added uh, the three virtues or theological virtues mentioned by St. Paul, faith, hope and love. So this idea of virtue uh, remained just as important in the Christian world but was uh, synthesized with this idea of supernatural virtues, right, which were considered even higher. Now uh, the, the idea of virtue has uh, suffered somewhat in the modern era and by modern era I'm not talking about the last few decades, I mean more like the last three or four centuries. <laughs> uh, and what are some of the reasons for it? Well, uh, initially some of the reasons would be things like the rejection of Aristotelianism, right? So in the 16th and 17th centuries there was a strong reaction in Western Europe against uh, the Catholic scholastic uh, tradition. Um, and uh, hand in hand with that, a rejection of Aristotelian modes of thought. Uh, and um, Coming with this, and especially in the 18th and 19th centuries, were efforts to search for new ways to think about ethics. So, for example, uh, Kant introduces a deontological ethic, which, and we'll, we'll, we're going to see this in a moment, the virtue ethical tradition saw the virtues as very much connected to the good life or the happy life, right? So it was connected to a very capacious sense of human excellence in general. Um, the Kantian ethic argued that anything other than the goodness of the act itself as pure duty tended to detract from the goodness of a moral action. And since virtue ethics was very tied into this concept of eudaimonia or happiness that I'll get into in a moment, uh, there was somewhat of uh, uh, virtue ethics was seen as somewhat problematic in that regard. Now, more recently, uh, have been issues like value pluralism, uh, can uh, meaning the idea that each individual should define uh, the good or goods <clears throat> for themselves, or that there's a wide selection of goods that an individual may choose, 
and so virtue ethics by seeming to prescribe uh, virtues for all of humanity, sort of defining the good life for all of humanity, seem to go against the individualism of the time. Uh, and uh, at the more extreme level, moral relativism, right? So moral relativism argues that the good as such uh, is relative uh, either to the culture or even to the individual, and therefore the notion of a universal moral good uh, is philosophically problematic, right? So there's a lot of trends going on in uh, modern thought. Perhaps another one would be the sciences, the, do the domination of the sciences. Uh, uh, is there such a thing as moral knowledge? Well, the Greek philosophers believe that there was. But the notion of knowledge outside of the empirical or scientific sphere has become more problematic for uh, aspects of modern thought. Now, none of this is to say that the virtues have actually become any less important uh, now than in former times. Indeed, one could argue, <laughs> in the manner of Alistair MacIntyre, that in fact, because they have been largely abandoned, they are ever more important. At any event, uh, whatever you think about <clears throat> this particular question, I think it is first important to understand the virtue ethic tradition, uh, which reigned in the Western world for some 15 centuries, if not more, uh, <clears throat> against which these modern theories are rebelling, right? Wherever side you come down on, you need to understand this uh, in order to understand the world. But even more importantly, if the classical philosophers are correct, then virtue is going to be important for your life, <laughs> deeply important. Right? If virtue is what the classical philosophers say that it is, important for your happiness, important for your friendships and relationships, important for the political systems in which you live, uh, then there can be no greater or more important uh, study in some respects <laughs> than the study of uh, virtue. Okay, now um, I'll just say... now. Well, just say a little bit about uh, the connection with, between virtue and happiness in Greek thought, right? So, this notion of eudaimonia is not necessarily the notion of pleasure, and this is something that uh, all the Greek philosophers are going to emphasize, virtually all of them. <laughs> virtually, no pun intended. Uh, the the uh, ethics for the Greeks uh, is related to the quest for the good life. What is the good and a uh, happy life. So, for example, uh, Socrates will state in the Crito that uh, that um, we still hold to this, uh, or not that it is not living, but living well, which we ought to consider most important. Right. So, Socrates is going to argue that what is most important is living well. Uh, and the, to live well, right, to fulfill uh, human potentialities, right, to live human life to the fullest is precisely to live virtuously, to live with excellence, right? It is the fulfillment of the highest part of ourselves, right, our moral and intellectual nature, bringing them to the full measure of their excellence. And virtue unlike things like wealth and pleasure and money and these sorts of things, is a good of the soul, right? And it is from the right order of the soul that happiness arises, right? So, if the Greek philosopher, and we're going to go in the course, we're going to discuss their arguments in far more detail, right? But if we accept this idea that the tranquility of the soul, its proper order, uh, is contingent upon the virtuous life, uh, then um, <clears throat> obviously virtue is going to be important, an important study for every uh, human being. But not only uh, was virtue connected for the Greek philosophers with the happy life, the eudaimonistic life of the individual, it also vitally concerned human relationships. So, for example, in um, Aristotle's discussion of virtue and friendship in the uh, 
in the Nicomachean Ethics, he talks about different kinds of friendship. Right? There are those friendships which are based upon mutual pleasure. Each friend gives pleasure to the other. There are those friendships which are based on utility. For example, each one uses the other for their, for, for example, business aims. Uh, but the only perfect form of friendship is the friendship which is grounded on virtue, where each friend genuinely desires the good of the other and desires to do good to the others. And friendship was a very core idea in classical uh, philosophy, much more so, I would say, <laughs> than in modern philosophy, right? The analysis of friendship, right? Friends, by their nature, do good to each other. They seek the good of the other. And, uh, and so they are helping, in a proper friendship, they are helping each other uh, to grow in virtue. So this is why Aristotle will say that while uh, a form of friendship can, be, can exist uh, among wicked persons, for example, the friendship among bank robbers, for example, <laughs> right? They, they have a kind of agreement among themselves to divide the loot. Uh, this can be called a form of friendship, but it can't be called true friendship because there's no virtue in it, right? Uh, and ultimately, uh, any friendship not founded in virtue is going to really be self-love more than it is love or solicitude. Uh, for the other, right? So these are, um, <clears throat> in a sense, we could say friendship properly so-called is focused on the virtues. And uh, it is true also for Greek philosophy that this is the case as well in terms of the political order, right? So the aim of the political order is also adate for both Plato and Aristotle, right? So for Plato... Uh, the right ordering of the soul uh, mirrors the right ordering of the city, right, of the polis, right? And Aristotle is uh, just as clear on this concept of virtue. He says, thus it is also clear that any state that is truly so called and is not a state merely in name must pay attention to virtue. Indeed, he'll say that <coughs> it is not simply for life that states have been organized to protect, but for the good life. Now, we have to keep in mind <coughs> the Greek concept of the state is not ours. The state is a translation of the Greek term polis, which means also the city. So we're talking about the community, right? The community which includes the political community. Um, the idea being that the state is really a form of friendship, the polis. I, I prefer, we'll just leave it untranslated because I think it conveys a better understanding, right? The polis, the city-state, the community, uh, is a form of friendship, right? It is the bonds of people who share uh, the same uh, community. Uh, and so, just as in, in a friendship between two people, each one is helping to, to the other to practice virtue, even if just by giving... Uh, each other opportunities to do good for one another. Uh, so, in the same manner, friendship is the basis of the political community for Aristotle, and consequently the good political community will be the virtuous political community. Right? You can't have a good political community without uh, the virtues. And uh, in the classical understanding, one cannot grow in virtue outside of a community. Right? It's not simply an individualistic thing. Although, <clears throat> in some of the more theoretical virtues, like, say, <laughs> the virtue of philosophical co contemplation, one is less dependent on others than, say, in the practice of generosity. How does one practice generosity with just oneself? How does one practice justice with just oneself, and so forth? Okay, so, uh, so I hope these points were clear. Uh, I'll mention some of the debates. So all of these these three topics, eudaimonia, uh, friendship, and politics, are all core to the Greek understanding. We're going to discuss particularly the issue of eudaimonia, uh, and um, and uh, in early on in the discussion when we uh, get to the uh, Nicomachean Ethics, particularly. Now it's worthwhile to talk about some of the debates within Greek philosophy on um, the virtues. So, 
one debate is on the teachability of virtue, right? Can one acquire virtue through instruction? And this is one of the topics of debate in the Protagoras. Um, but it goes back a while, right? Um, Jaeger also mentions the poet Pindar, who was very favorable toward the aristocratic class, who regarded virtue as a gift from the gods, right? Bestowed upon certain uh, classes of people, right? So in this conception, uh, one cannot really acquire the virtues, they're sort of given, right? They are gifts. Um, and Socrates and the Protagoras raises certain points on behalf of this notion. For example, why do we often see virtuous uh, parents give rise to unvirtuous children, or not particularly virtuous children? So, uh, so it is, uh, you know, an important issue, right? Can virtues be acquired, or do you just have them? Is it like uh, eye color, or that sort of thing? Uh, and if they can be acquired, how can they be acquired? Um, and then this relates to the question of virtue and wisdom. If a person can acquire wisdom through uh, a, a virtue through instruction, that means that they can acquire it through intellectual knowledge or wisdom. And on this issue, there's partial agreement among the Greek philosophers and partial disagreement. Uh, Plato um, and Plato's Socrates have a, uh, what has been called ethical intellectualism, right? They see a very, very, very close tie between virtue and wisdom to the point that they see the opposite is true as well, uh, that vice is a concept, consequence of ignorance, right? The person who truly understands the good cannot do the evil because they would see that they're harming themselves. This is eudaimonia again. You are hurting your own happiness by acting um, viciously, right? By, by, by acquiring vices instead of virtues, you're harming yourself. And if you truly understood that, you would not behave in a vicious manner. But for Aristotle, uh, it's not only a question of intellectual instruction, whatever importance this may have. It is also a question of habit, because the habits of self-mastery and self-control are what enables um, the person to uh, contain the, pa the force of the passions, uh, which can overwhelm uh, that which we know to be right. Okay, so we have these two traditions, right? The highly intellectualist tradition of Plato and a more habit-focused uh, tradition in Aristotle. Now, um, another uh, important topic is, so this relates, in a, what I've just discussed relates to um, the virtue and the intellect. There is also, we have to say, uh, the issue of virtue and the passions, uh, right? What is virtue's relations to the passions? Well, um, in the Platonic and Aristotelian tradition, I would say, right, uh, reason has a regulative role in relation to the passions, right? So the role of virtue is to con constrain the passions um, to obey the rulership of reason. Plato in the Phaedrus even has this uh, <laughs> harsh image of the charioteer whipping the, the horses of passion into, sh into shape, as it were. Um, and so Aristotle will see this regulative role. Where they, where they, where they differ is um, to what degree can virtue and the passions coexist? Aristotle thinks that they can coexist, right? The passions do need to be educated, educated through habits, right? Through the right habits of conduct. Uh, but the passions per se are not bad, right? The passions and appetites are not uh, in, intrinsically bad. Um, in the Stoic tradition, we have the notion of apatheia, right? That a, a, a you know a much stronger transcendence of the passions is required to become a true sage, a sophon, sophos, and so forth. So uh, there was this uh, kind of debate, and it's related also to the status of pleasure. Uh, is pleasure a good? Is it the supreme good? Is it an evil? And so forth. Ultimately. Uh, right, the Aristotelian position is that pleasure is, uh, you know, not an evil, right? There are good pleasures. Uh, the good person takes pleasure in good things, but that pleasure is not the supreme good. It's more of a concomitant good. Um, now, another thing we're obviously going to be discussing uh, in this class will be the particular virtues, 
And again, I think we should pay attention especially to these four cardinal virtues of currence, prudence, justice, temperance, and so forth. But there are others that we will discuss, uh, virtues like liberality or generosity. And I think one of the most interesting ones is the Aristotelian idea of the megalopsuchos, uh, the great soul man, who in a sense, uh, <coughs> who in a sense combines or synthesizes all of the virtues, right? And I think that that's that that's uh, what, what I find one of the most uh, interesting chapters in the uh, Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, now, of course, for Plato, the sort of the the megalopsuchos would be Socrates himself, right? Socrates is sort of the embodiment uh, of virtue, and I think when you read these dialogues, right, um, one gets a sense of uh, what the virtuous life is for uh, Socrates and Plato. So I think this provides an overview of this class, um, which I am very confident that you will find it not only interesting, but I, I should hope uh, rewarding for your, uh, for your personal life, for your reflections, and for your um, relationships with others. Um, thank you very much, and um, I hope uh, to, I look forward to your thoughts and comments in this course.